Here's a special important message. Hello there, welcome to episode three of We Are The Road Crew. My name is Stephen Hill, I am your host, and um, by now, after a couple of episodes, you should know that this podcast is a podcast where I interview somebody from the world of music, but not a musician per se, somebody instead who is a member of the backstage team, someone who puts together live music and lives um, on the road, out in the world, every single day, on tour, one of those people. Um, Now... This week, if you are aware of myself and the work that I do, you probably know that I like metal. Uh, If you're new to the sort of stuff that I like, then um, I like metal. So there you go. Now you know, which is why I'm particularly excited about this week's guest because joining me this week is graham wright uh graham is the co-writer of a book called how black was our sabbath a book that he wrote with his friend david tangy and both of those guys were former crew members with black sabbath um back in the hallisian glory days of black sabbath the kind of the 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 spark the tinder that uh that lit the forest fire that has become heavy metal so um I can never get enough of uh, listening to and reading stories about the genesis of heavy metal. And as you are all probably aware, Black Sabbath were and are still remain the most important metal band of all time. I'm going to just put that out there, not even as an opinion, but straight out as a fact. And um, and Graham was a man who saw all of that stuff happening. Very, very close friends with Ozzy and... Um, you know, from the kind of the 1970s, that that period where Black Sabbath were pinging out absolute worldy classic genre defining records every single year. Graham was there out on tour with them, seeing some of those amazing shows, seeing some of the debauchery and the the, the legendary stories that Ozzy and Tony and Geezer and Bill got up to back in those days. And then he moved on, and uh, we will also, as well as Black Sabbath, we will talk about all the other many things that he has done because he's a man who's still working to this very day, uh, working with the likes of the Rolling Stones and U2, and um, potentially we will talk about a very moving and uh difficult thing that that graham had to go through as well so i'm I'm not going to spoil that right now but um yes graham wright is our is our guest for this week so we should just get on and get chatting to him right now before i do that i just want to say thank you if you've given us any love over on our facebook page um if you've started following us on twitter at road crew pod then um we are very very grateful for that and any kind of feedback that you want to give us on the old itunes or um you know wherever you listen to your podcast that would be very much appreciated but for now sit back relax and enjoy episode three of we are the road crew with graham wright here he is all right graham thank you very much for joining us i can see um as we're doing this over skype you in a room with photographs behind you uh with a fair few people that i i dare say many of our listeners would recognize um yeah. it feels yeah. like uh from what i can see quite a quite a nice monument to uh, an incredibly interesting life which we will speak about as as the podcast goes on um but i think the first thing you want to do and you just mentioned it straight away so let's go straight into it um how black was our sabbath uh your book it, it's something which myself and david tang who was um Ozzy's right hand man for a few years um, in the late seventies, early eighties. Um, we said that when, when we got to fifty, we'd write a book about what it was like working for a band um, touring the states, Europe, and from the crew's point of view, not from a journalist's point of view, from the people who were actually there doing it. And that's what the book was about. You know, it was a, a view from the crew. We started writing it in um, when we were 50 year old. Um, I think it came out about 15 years ago. Mm. We, we've also got it as an e-book um, on Amazon um, called Black Sabbath, The Thrill of It All. It was uh, enjoyable and it was good, you know. Well, hopefully we'll get into a fair bit of that. But I think there's almost there's, there's more to talk about than, than just Black Sabbath. But before we get into all that, um, 
I'm interested in you and your kind of um, your passion for music and where that initially came from. Can you remember, as this is a podcast kind of about live music, your first or most memorable experience as a young man seeing live music and who that band was and what it did to you? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm going back to the 60s and I, I was... I was born in 1950, so you've got to realise that when I was 15, you know, it was like 1966, and I, was, I, I, I saw the Rolling Stones at the local um, theatre in Stockton on Tees. <laughs> wow. I saw the Beatles. God. Um, the band called The Shadows. Um, and yeah, I was, I was, I was right in the start of it all. And to actually go and see the Beatles was unbelievable. I mean. Plus the music was, it was, you know, we, we, it, it was fantastic. You can't actually describe how it was. You, you have to be there, mm. you know. And um, I still reminisce about it, you know. And it's, it's, but it was, it, what it was in those days was the start of a lot of um, great bands as well. It wasn't just the Beatles and the Stones. I mean, it was the Kinks. It was, there was something going on which was fantastic i mean i used to go and see rod stewart in a local club with um the steam packet that's mad um, yeah <laughs> so you know, mad. and eric clapton with J- john mill and the blues breakers and and we had these you know all these bands were coming to to local clubs that we used to go in when we were teenagers and yeah it was um fantastic times you know and and also what was happening in America, you know, we were getting all the, the West Coast music coming over mm. and, and going to festivals and going to see the Mothers of Invention, going to see Jefferson Airplane. Yeah, I mean, it, it just goes on and on, you know. Um, it was great days. It, it, it was live. It was... Um, the influences were fantastic. Yeah. You know? I have to ask you, I mean, it's very rare that you get to talk to someone who's actually seen the Beatles live and they played so in real you know i know they obviously did many 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 gigs before they became you know the 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 biggest band of all time but for that period of the beatles being a band didn't actually play live for a kind of fairly large bit of their recording career so to have actually seen them live i guess must have been it's fairly rare you know especially for such a huge band um I know you said you can't remember it and you had to be there and it's very hard to explain, but I'm going to push you on it anyway. The Beatles we, in concert, what did that you, do? You could hardly hear them. We really? Didn't have, yeah, the PAs in those days were mm. non-existent. Mm. And the girls were, were screaming their heads off. I mean, it was just, <laughs> you know, you you basically went, you could just about hear, you could just about hear that what songs were playing, but there was nothing... Like, it wasn't like, you know, it was an event. It was a chaotic event. That's the best way to describe it, because you couldn't hear them, really. Yeah, you know? right, okay. Um, so you had no idea that they were going to go on to be the, the sort of most important musical thing of all time, pretty much? Well, well yeah, we, they, they were. They were huge. I mean, they went on, you know, you knew it. This was this was something special. This was This was something really different, you know. And it just went on from there, you know. I mean, great days, great days. I mean, great days to be a teenager. You yeah, know, I'm sure. That's the way it was. I mean, I never dreamt that I'd, I'd become a roadie, you know, because, I mean, the word roadie didn't even exist in those days, you know. Well, let's let's chat about that then. Let's chat about the kind of, um, I guess, you know, the uh, the guinea pig for the roadie world, as, as many of your generation were. Um, yeah. How did you get into music? How did you, uh, as a kind of career, as a potential job, like, did it ever kind of strike you as something that you would, or you could make an actual living out of and, and turn into a career? Not at all. I'd gone on to a few gigs with local bands, just helping them out, you know. And it was it was more of a kind of like, oh, you know, I'll help you carry the 4B12 into the gig, you know, and yeah. help them. I mean, and it just seemed like it was a way of um, getting... a into a gig and partying with the lads, you know, and this, this, this was like in my teenage years. And when I got to, I went to college and, and I did, I did a fine art um, course at college and I left that and I had the choice. I thought, Oh, do I want to go into teaching? What shall I do? You know, the, the usual things that happen when you, you come out of college, you know, which direction shall I go? And a friend of mine said, Oh, I've, I've got this daft job you might be interested in. It's, 
this band uh, are going to Scandinavia. I was like 20, 20 year old. Um, they're going to Scandinavia and um, they need somebody to go with them just to help them with the equipment. And it was like a paid holiday. It was mm. just like, oh, yeah, you know, I fancy doing that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give my hand, you know, and, and off we went. And we finished this tour of sort of, I think it was Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland. And I was enjoying it. It was just like a, a working holiday. And at the end of the gig, I thought, well, that'll be it, you know. And I was getting paid. I was getting paid to, <laughs> to, to do it and enjoying myself. And they says, oh, we're going to America. Do you fancy coming? I went, what? An American tour. And this was um, 1972. And I, off I went to America with this band. And there were a band called Aussie Beesa. And I started putting all the drums up and the drum kits, and and, and I become like a drum roadie basically. Right. And I went and did this tour of America with them, and we 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 did gigs all over the states. And I was just like blown away by it. It was you know, we, and, and we were supporting bands like Stevie Wonder, Ike and Tina Turner at, at, at Madison Square Garden. Um, and there's me twenty. I was twenty one then. I was twenty one year old, and I'm I'm. I'm touring around America with this band, you know, and uh, Quicksilver Messenger Service, Spirit, oh, there was all, there was loads of incredible times. And I went back to, we went back to England, I, I'm in London, I've got to know the roadies, got into them, you know, and suddenly I became a roadie. It, it was all by accident. Yeah. And I started working for other bands until, um, well, it would have been about 1973, I heard that Bill Ward needed a drum roadie from Black Sabbath and I went for the interview with Bill and we got on really well and I became Bill's drum roadie which eventually ended up being I eventually ended up being the stage manager with Black Sabbath and um, worked with them for the rest of the 70s wow and it was that was you know can you imagine yeah of course hopefully I won't have to imagine we're going to find out exactly the kind of nitty gritty because Black Sabbath in 1974 so we're talking what volume four um, um, going into yeah. sabotage, going into Sabbath, it, bloody it was, Sabbath um, sort of stuff. Yeah, it was it was um, Sabbath, bloody Sabbath. Uh, it, it was sabotage. It was basically we were they were rehearsing for sabotage. Uh, they'd just done a, a, a UK tour when mm-hmm. I um, joined them, and yeah, it was um, that was this, the start of it, you know. And, and 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 the productions were getting bigger as well. Sabbath production was getting bigger, and the lighting companies were getting bigger. We used to go to America and we were using um, Tiger Bray sound and Orbeez lighting and, you know, the, the whole of the stage would be covered in par cans and, and productions were getting bigger. It was the, the start of the full on, you know, stage sets and, you know, it was, it was, you know, it, it was, it, it was an interesting time to be around because we laugh at it now because there was nobody old in them days. <laughs> All the bands were young, you know, yeah. even the Stones were young, you know. And all the roadies were young. We're all a bunch of kids. Yeah. You know, I remember. I remember the, there was there was one lad on the tour, um, and he was an old mate of Aussies from a, a, the pub that he used to go to in England. And he was thirty years old, and we used to call him Granddad. <laughs> and I, we used to say to him, "Are you sure you're going to be okay?" You know. I mean, you know, and and that's how it was in those days. Yeah. You know? Um, great days. I mean, you know. You laugh at it now. <laughs> so I have to ask, I mean, so presumably you've been on tour with a few bands. I mean, Madison Square Garden with Tina Turner, that sounds like a, you know, a, a raucous old night out back in kind of 1972. Oh, I can't imagine anything yeah. more, much more exciting than that. Out, out of all the, all the bands we supported in those days, I mean, even Stevie Wonder, and I remember that gig so well because um, it was Ike and Tina Turner and the Iquettes. And I remember the Iquettes coming off stage and doing that dance mm. and getting flowers and, you know, and then Tina Turner with bouquets of flowers. And um, it was magical. It was magical. And it was funny because, like, years later, I, I worked with Tina in Europe and did some really big tours with Tina years later, which was, like, quite, you know. And I actually mentioned it to her. I said, I was there in 1972 with Madison Square Garden she was like oh wow you know so doing that pre-Black Sabbath presumably you'd become to uh got used to the lifestyle of a kind of a road man a a road crew member how were you taking to the job 
kind of pre Black Sabbath years and how much did it change? Because I guess we'll get onto Black Sabbath and where Black Sabbath were as personalities at that point. But kind of pre Black Sabbath, what was the kind of the vibe on the road like? What did the kind of normal day look like to you? And, you know, how much of the um the partying that I guess we will expect to talk about when we get to kind of Black Sabbath level, how much was that kind of seeping into your life at that um, point? You see, the, the thing about the being being a road, because in those days we were driving the vans ourselves. You know, there might be, you might have a band that's got like three three roadies. One one guy, you'd be looking after the PA. You'd carry a small PA. That's his job. I'd be looking after the, the back line. You'd have a guitar roadie who could tune guitars, blah, blah. You know, the usual. There'd be three of you, but... You'd have a van or a small three-ton truck or, you know, it depends on... They, they, they weren't the, the big Arctics carrying gears around. You know, it was... And you were doing clubs, a lot of clubs or university gigs. Yeah. So you had to um, either go back to London if you were based in London or you'd go to a hotel, you know, you'd go to some cheap hotel. But you were driving, so you couldn't really party because you had to keep yourself sober. Right. I mean... The only time you'd party, really, would be as if um, you had a day off and then you'd go out and the band would, you know, meet up with the band and then, you know, you'd just... But you had to keep you had to keep a, a certain amount of um, sobriety mm. to do the job, you know. The ones who did party didn't last. Right. The ones, the roadies that went there just for the party and, you know, they'd come and they'd go, you know, because obviously, you know, they'd, they'd become a liability. Yeah. So... The ones who, um, I mean, I'm not saying that we didn't party, but we did. But um, there was, there, I think, I think a lot of a lot of the the roadies that I knew who lasted the were, were quite serious about the job because they enjoyed doing a, a good job and putting on a good show. Mm. You know, it was it was important, mm. and that's why you you were kept on the road with bands. You know, you got a good crew. You got you know bands bands with a good crew were like gold dust. Yeah. So the kind of the the love of the music and the love to kind of put on a proper oh, yeah. spectacle for people kind of outlived just going. Let's just have this troubadour esque lifestyle where we go around and just you know because oh, you yeah. watch stuff like you watch a film like Almost Famous and you you know you think well what a what a beautifully you know kind of romantic idea that in the nineteen <laughs> seventies we just all chucked our gear on a bus and off we went and there were fights breaking out and do you know what I mean and, and you kind of that romantic idea you know for people my age who weren't there to see that yeah. we even you know you're saying what a great time it was and i think people of my generation particularly probably romanticize about ah oh, you know the the glory days before i was around and i would have loved to have seen it and all that but actually you're saying it's a lot more professional than maybe i would <laughs> imagine yeah. in my my kind of wildest fantasies yeah yeah I mean, i've been on tours of america where it was boring you know right, I mean, okay oh god you know you Especially when when we started using tour buses, because um, you'd get like three gigs in a row. You'd go in there, you'd put all the lights up, all the sound, all the back line. You'd spend all day making sure everything's okay. The band had come in for the sound check. They'd do the show. You've got to tear everything down, put it in the trucks, jump on the tour bus, go to the next venue, get off the tour bus, start again. And especially in America where you've got arenas, you felt like you'd just driven around the the arena for eight hours got out and started work again. Yeah. You, know, you know, you have to sort of keep going. Um, the most partying was when when we're in the when bands were in the studio recording albums mm. because then you were you you were stuck in one place all the time. You know. With that in mind, let's get on to Black Sabbath. I'm interested in um, in Black Sabbath as a. I mean, the band and the music obviously it goes without saying. They're they're the most important metal band of all time that's never going to change no one's ever going to come along and um usurp them from that i don't think yeah. but particularly when you came along we're talking about black sabbath i guess at their commercial peak or are they i mean certainly those kind of first six albums are the albums that people now hold up as this kind of holy grail this kind of perfect run of records um what were they like as personalities kind of individually and how explosive was that chemistry between them when you first started working with the band? Um, what I um, I thought w- was how um, creative they were, how professional they were, especially, you, you know, you've got Tony and Geezer and, and Bill, very into their instruments, mm. very into producing good music. 
and creative, very creative. And w when they toured, they wanted to put on a good show, and they did. They did. They, they, their shows were brilliant. I mean, and we had a good crew as well. They, you know, we we had a great stage. It was. It, it, it's difficult to um, explain, but um, one of the reasons why they lasted so long was um, because they just believed in what they were doing. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't a complete twenty-four hour drug fest seven days a week. It wasn't like that. Yeah. Um, there was. There, there was times when they did look after themselves and um, they put, you know they kept themselves together. You have to realise that when you're in a band as well, you've got you've got your families, you've got your wives, you've got your distractions, and you know there's a lot of pressure on people. And then you're on the road, um, so you've got to try and balance things out. You know, and, and it, it can be hard, you know, it can be hard. And I think the, the, the music press tend to, um, they don't want to hear about this, like the, the pouring sort of like mm. side of, they want, they, want, they want to hear about the parties, they want to hear about the, the groupies, they want to hear about, you know, that that's that's the um, what, what's exciting to them and to the readers, you know, and to people, even the fans, you know, they want to believe that, it's this fantastic sort of like um, wild life, you know. I, it was always a th like, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess as a fan, I always looked at it and I was like, they made sabotage where they could barely, you know, it's, you know, Tony couldn't sit up and yet he still could write Hole in the Sky and stuff like that. And you're just like, how? How, is, <laughs> like, how could you possibly do that? But it makes, you know, obviously it makes sense that it, those albums couldn't have been made by people who weren't no. taking the job seriously. No, no, no. They, 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 they did. They were very, um, very professional. I mean, Tony's a great uh, musician. So you were probably closest to Bill then, as you were working yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of underneath him. Um, Bill Ward, probably one of the most underrated drummers in oh, mis music history. Bill's a one-off. Yeah. He's a total one-off. I mean, incredible drummer. I used to sit, you know, set. Obviously, I set his kid up, and I, 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 I watched Bill play. Oh God lost count how many times hundreds um and brilliant a brilliant drummer i can't i can't i can't praise him enough and I've, I've seen a lot of drummers and bill was a unique and you just have to listen to the albums and, and i mean a lot of people forget that bill played on heaven and hell yeah on that on that album that was bill yeah. it wasn't it wasn't Vinny Appice, it wasn't anybody else it was bill on heaven and hell everyone will talk about the invention of the riff from tony iomi everyone loves the character of Ozzy Osbourne I think yeah. people are aware that Geezer is in this incredible bassist and as you say wrote the lyrics and stuff but for me the the swing and the momentum that well, Bill Ward's drums bring to Black Sabbath is just such a such an integral in, like absolutely integral and untalked oh, I, about part of what is great about that band yeah yeah but Bill Bill he, he loved the band he was he was he, he kept a lot of the band together as well he was he was he was he was the cement in the band in them days as well, you know. Mm. He looked after Geezer, he looked after, you know, he was on the phone to Tony, on the phone to, to Ozzy. I mean, Ozzy and Bill were very close, you know. So, but so was Bill was close with um, Tony. I mean, they played together before they met Ozzy and Geezer, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of history there, you know. But I mean, I was going to ask as well, um, talking about Bill and his personality, Again, the thing that the the press seem to pick up on quite a lot is that Bill was sort of the the whipping boy of the band. That you know, they had all the you know the 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 sort of the pranks would be played on Bill by Ozzy. Um, I remember seeing them at the Milton Keynes Bowl. The first time I saw Black Sabbath was in 1998 at the Ozfest at the Milton Keynes Bowl, and Bill wasn't drumming because he you know wasn't feeling up to it. But he did come out on stage, came out on stage, and Ozzy pulled his pants down straight away in front of sort of oh, yeah, sixty thousand yeah. people. Um, how did Bill take to that? And you know what was the kind of <laughs> what was everyone's sort of um, reaction yeah. to, to well, Bill around that time? I mean, Ozzy used to pull pranks on Bill because he, he loved him. It, it was it was a kind of like it was. Yeah. I mean, I used to pull pranks on Bill. You know, <laughs> we all did. <laughs> but it was a way of um, it's it's that it's that kind of like weird British thing where you you love somebody so you you know you it's almost like you insult them. But yeah. You, you know, it's, it's it's just um, no no it was it was it was always done in 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 fun. You know, it wasn't it was never malicious. So the pranks were never nasty you know it was just a you know a, a, a laugh i mean he and he he used to put himself up for it as well you know 
So what was the camaraderie like touring around the world with Black Sabbath over those years? Because um, obviously Ozzy and Bill did leave uh, while you were still working for the band, were they? We, we, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so how did that go from, you know, Black Sabbath, this all-conquering band, and how did you feel and how did you see it from your perspective as it sort of started to cr- crumble and go off the rails a bit? I think it was just um, it, it 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 came to a, a, a kind of weird end because um, I think it was a state of the uh, music at the time as well. And um, when Ozzy left, it was I think it was about nineteen seventy nine. Yeah, they were struggling um, to get. To, they were rehearsing it in, in of all places in this house in Bel Air, and they were rehearsing, and um, they were trying to. And and Ozzy was going through um, a divorce as well with his wife. Yeah, they were struggling um, trying to create the album Heaven and Hell, and then Ozzy, Ozzy left. They decided to go to Miami. And they got Ronnie Dio in, and off they went to Miami. And I was I was working for them. We, in fact, me and Bill drove across the states with the equipment in a rider truck, right. and we checked into um, a hotel in Miami. And the rest is history. Basically, we. We actually rented Barry Gibbs' house um, oh, yeah. from the Beatles and wow. went into Criteria Studios, set up the equipment, and they produced Heaven and Hell. And what a great album. You great know. record, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. A, a, yeah. a great record. Um, how did that change? I mean, when all that was kind of was happening, um, I think people obviously from an outside perspective from a fan's perspective when a band is 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 massive and you think they might split up or they might go away you think about the four five however many members there are in the band but when you're a band as big as black sabbath that's your livelihood isn't it and that's you know that you know i'm sure that you weren't the only person who was relying on black sabbath and the kind of the machine that was black sabbath continuing on um how did that kind of how did your job change and was there any ever any point during that period where you sort of thought if this comes to an end then i've sort of fallen into this thing i don't know where i roll out from were there any kind of worries from you at that around that time yeah i think i think i think it was, yeah it was i did i did i didn't i wouldn't say i was really worried because you know that i was still fairly young you know and, but yeah, I mean, we we eventually went on tour with the Heaven and Hell album, and we did this. Um, it was called the Black and Blue tour um, with Blue Oyster Cult. Right. And we toured around America, and um, and then Bill left the band. Yeah. And that's when I went. Well, you know, I can't see myself carrying on with this lot really because Vinny came in, great guy. Set I set Vinny's drums up for a few weeks. And then I decided to um, leave as well, you know. Mm. And it was like that was the end of it for me with Black Sabbath, you know. And I went on to do other things and, you know, eventually started working with different bands and I just carried on. I ended up working for, like, UFO and Scorpions and, yeah, (laughs) just carried on, you know. Well, it was a a shame, it was a shame, but um, I couldn't carry on working with them. I mean, I actually... In, in in the eighties, I, I came back to England and um, I actually I did a, a tour with Ozzy. It only lasted one tour, but there you go. <laughs> was that during Ozzy's kind of infamous? I mean, I guess it, it, in the eighties, Ozzy became, you know, the the kind of the go to demon of the the sort of mainstream conservative press to sort of no, demonise. Was there a lot of um, yeah, a lot of that I mean, going on? Yeah, I mean, I was I, I, I was you know it was. <laughs> You know, he was always in the press, you know, and he he was just playing the part of Ozzy Osbourne, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, he played it very well. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly did. Um, how does that kind of atmosphere change what you do in your job, or does it not at all? Are you not no. affected by that kind of stuff at all? No, no, because you, you, you can see what's going on, you know. Um, you mentioned your face, so obviously you kind of moved on. Um, I believe you met your wife through touring with ufo is that right yeah 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 okay yeah, 86 86 we were in uh, austin texas and my wife we were staying in the sheraton hotel in austin and my wife was working in the hotel and i asked her for a date and um, we're still together <laughs> wow 
thirty odd years later. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, the, we have Tinder these days and <laughs> and online yeah. dating apps. Whereas I guess back in those days, if you really wanted to connect with someone, you had to kind of tour the world with no, a rock no, band. No, and, no, no. She was working in the hotel, and I asked for a date, and then we went. Um, we went down Sixth Street in Austin, partying and. Um, you know, Austin was a great, great city in those days. I mean, it was like a, it was a, a very musical city, and the, there was a work, the Armadillo World Headquarters, and it was oh, a great place. And um, yeah, that's where I met my wife, and uh, we we ended up going up to Canada, and um, then she came over to England. We settled in England, and we've been here for thirty years. Back, you know. How does she feel about your um, your kind of your life's work? Because uh, I guess you're away a lot. Um, oh, which was I, I, I difficult, was or was, was, yeah, or was. I mean, yeah. you know, would have been away a lot for yeah, the last. She, was, she, she, she accepted it. You know, she accepted it because I'd, I'd, I'd go. You know, I was earning the books. You know, so mm. it was like you know, we. I used to go off on tour, come home. You know, I mean, you just you, you pay the bills, you buy a house. You know, you, you have your kids. My kids are great. They're growing up. In fact, my, my son Daniel, it was his 30th birthday the other day, and he flew over from Holland, and we had a family meal and um, had a great time up in the, the North Yorkshire Moors, went to a little pub and had a meal, and um, he flew back um, yesterday. And, yeah, great times. After kind of however many years of, of touring, I suspect that must be it must, it's like I think footballers often say it. it's nice to have Christmas when you retire from football because obviously they're meant to be playing the next day. So for you, it must be nice just to kind of potter around and and enjoy your, your sort of just the kind of yeah, normality I mean, of and routine of normal life, I guess. Yeah, because when you when you're touring, when you're on the road touring, I mean you you lose all track of you don't know whether it's Saturday, Sunday, mm. Monday, Tuesday. You don't know where. I've, I've been on tours where somebody said, "Oh, guess what? You know what? Oh, it's Easter Monday. You know, and you're <laughs> doing the gig. You know, yeah. and it, oh, I've been working on Christmas Day. You know, yeah. New Year's Eve, and flying to America on New Year's Eve, and getting two New Years. You know, but it's it's that's that's one of the things about being on the road as well is that um, you, you you're not on a nine to five job. Yeah. You're in a totally different. There's no routine, you know. The, the only routine would be to um, setting up the gigs, you know, setting up the the, the equipment. And uh, but you know, as far as days, weeks, oh, it's you know, it was unbelievable. unbelievable. And and probably first up and last to bed as well. Yeah, yeah. Later on, later on, that was very much the case because I I stopped I stopped being a backline tech and I became a a stage set carpenter come design and mm. oh, there's all sorts of things you know it did just went totally different i'd go in first thing in the morning with the riggers and leave with the riggers on the night you know so it's, it's a long day what would it yeah, yeah. what would it what would a normal day i mean is is there such thing in your in your job as a a quote unquote normal day um the normal day once you're on a tour yeah because especially when you're on a a, a large arena tour you go in, you go, the riggers go in, you know, the lampies, the sound come, you know, everybody goes in and puts a show on. So you, you, everybody's got a routine and it works like clockwork and that's the only way it can. So you, you know, you go on tours and there might be 22 trucks full of equipment and it goes in six o'clock in the morning and it goes out by two o'clock in the, the next morning. You know, it's, it's done. It's done and dusted. Yeah. But everybody has a job to do. And it is a well-oiled machine, and that's how tours work. You stopped working with the Scorpions, I believe you said, in 1994. Is that right? Yeah, around about that. Okay. Yeah, I, was, I was with them, uh, yeah, it was like 88 to, yeah, it was about four, five, six, seven, seven years, I think. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask you about where that kind of rock music sat, and if you saw any difference in terms of venue sizes crowd response during the 90s because there's obviously the the kind of um the 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 very well-worn story that nirvana came in and then anything pre-nirvana was just shoved to one side and that was it it was gone it was you know it was old hat it was uncouth it was you know it was (laughs) dead it was gone it was dinosaur like how as a band who i think probably not my words but would have been described as kind of the old guard certainly at that time how was it for them uh and how did you find navigating the 90s with those types of bands yeah i think i think there was a there was a lull for 
certain bands that that yeah but w- when you had that kind of like nirvana i mean even even the brit pop stuff you know the yeah. you, you got this sort of you know cocky manchester bands you know like oasis and oh yeah we, we're great you know we you know all these old dinosaurs have had the day you know and yeah there was a bit of that going but you look at what's happening now and bands like black sabbath and the Stones are still doing it. Mm. They're still filling out arenas. The Stones are still doing stadium gigs, you know. So as that kind of happened and you saw that dwindling a little bit in the 90s, did that affect um, the types of bands that you could work for? Or, you know, did that change kind of... Did you feel like there was a trickle-down effect to your profession that actually made people go, oh, no, that's just some Black Sabbath, you know, they, those guys, those days are over. Do you know what I mean? I didn't, yeah, I mean, I didn't I didn't really work with any... I mean, I, I went into do, um, working, doing stage set work mm-hmm. and helping to build sets, and that was what I was doing in the 90s. And um, I was, you know, I, was, I, I went out with Tina Turner as a stage set carpenter, you know, and um, and even small bands, you know, there was like pop bands in England that were using stage sets. And they were, they, they were actually using stage sets because they wanted like heavy metal looking stage sets. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it was a weird time. It was a weird time, but that's what I was doing. And started doing work with bands like U2. I did, I did a lot of U2 tours. Um, um, Tina Turner, I did, I did a lot of work with, with Tina. Mm. Um, and because she was, she, in Europe, she was massive. Yeah. I mean, she was, you know, and, and I worked with like Skid Row. I mean, you can see all my, my Tina Turner. I can, stuff yeah. Here. Yeah. You know, that's. Roger Walters, you know. is that as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah Brian yeah. Adams. Yeah. 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 I mean, big, big acts. With Roger Walters, I've done a couple of wall tours. I was touring last year on the uh, Us and Them tour, you know. Yeah. I finished in August last year in Moscow. The Wall Spectacular is something which I've never managed to see with my own eyes, live in the good, flesh. Yeah. But it's something which, I mean, The Wall's one of my favourite albums ever made. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely it's just incredible. Uh, I love it. And I would, I've seen clips on YouTube of, of that show. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it looks incredible. I mean... As a man who has designed stage, I mean, how big an accomplishment is, is something like that? I was also going to ask you about U2 as well. I mean, they're a band who, I suppose, when you, you were working with them, you know, coming out of the Lemon and the big sort of Zoo TV yeah. shows they were doing, yeah. like, how difficult is it to put those shows together? Like, And when you see it, that must feel incredibly rewarding to felt like you were part of something which is so huge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... It, but, it, what what you've got is you've got the, you know, they the use the top people in the business. You know, you've you've got the production teams, the production managers who are always the top, the top people. Mm. You know, and everybody knows who they are. You know, and and the the crews, um, the trucking companies are the best that you can get. You know, and and every all the truck drivers are seasoned rock and roll truck drivers and. It all it all works out in America. That you have upstaging, and you've got in England, you've got Trans Am trucking. You know, it's it, it, it just goes on, and this is it's a it's 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 in some ways it's a small world because everybody knows each other as well, and you get you get crews going from one tour to the other. You know, they'll finish say you two, then they'll go off and do the stones, and it's a it's, it's a you know again it's like a well well oiled machine. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, these days as well, I mean, with all the video as well, it's huge. You know, video is like basically taken over a lot of the live. They used to spend a lot of money on sets. Now they're just using, spending money on huge video screens. So you've got the stadium and, and it's like watching a giant television. <laughs> yeah, it's you know? big telly. Yeah, that's what I call it. Big yeah, telly no, I mean, Yeah. That's what they're doing now, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I still think even you know going to the olympic stadium or the wembley or whatever you still need to see a band who are a great live band they need to be able to do that like undoubtedly i think with you could chuck as much pyro and you know big tellies at it as you want but if the band are no good then uh, certainly you can tell they have great pa systems as well you know like claire brothers do the you know incredible pa systems where years ago it was always a bit dodgy you know you get you know you can you it, yeah, I mean, you know, you, 
a band's a great band is a great band, you know. And, um, if it's a turd, well, you can't polish it. You know? <laughs> That's quite right. That's quite right. Um, just to kind of change tact and change the subject a little bit, and to, I guess to move on to something which is probably not an easy thing to talk about. But as you've spoken about, kind of many of the amazing things you've seen and the great gigs that you've been to and the kind of I guess what was fantastic life that you've led um fate kind of stepped in a little bit on the 13th of november in 2015 for you didn't it um uh that obviously for people listening will know that that was the the eagles of death metal show at the battle clan yeah, yeah um yeah. and i believe that it was a gig that you were due to attend yeah well it was a it was a strange one it was because um the singer what was it Jesse? Jesse. The singer, yeah. He he interviewed me for this um this it was a, a Marshall's headphone um series that he did a few years before that. Mm-hmm. And he interviewed me about being a roadie with Sabbath. Um and it was interviewed in an old pub in Birmingham that they used to play at. So anyway, I did this I got to know them know him then and I did this thing and did you can see it on YouTube, um it's it's a Marshall headphones um, series. Yeah. Anyway, I was I was working. I was on the U two tour, and we. I thought, oh, I'd heard that the, I was going to just go down to the back plant and say hello. Just you know, because you know, I, uh, I hadn't seen them, uh, heard of them, and I didn't know. I didn't really know much about the the band, and I was just I was thinking, all right, I'm going to go down there and. You two decided to do um, a sound check, which wasn't planned, and yeah. they wanted somebody to operate one of the spotlights. And he says, "Oh, do you want to do it, Graham?" And I went, "Oh, yeah, okay, I'll." You know, job comes first. Mm. So I, I stayed back and I didn't go down to the gig. And maybe it's a good job I didn't because I, I knew one of the lads who got killed. It was the 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 cut the t shirt guy who was selling t shirts for them. He That's was the gig. Nick, Nick Alexander, I believe yeah, his Nick, name was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd worked with Nick in the past, and so I didn't go down there. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, terrible, terrible, terrible thing to happen. You know, mm-hmm. um, shocking. You know. Um, and then, and then this is this is what's been going on in our, our lives isn't it you know for everybody you know yeah, yeah. i think it's even yeah. more shocking um for for fans of music i mean for so many of us we listen to music as an escape from yeah the sort of either the mundanity or the horror of the outside world the real world and you know i always feel that when i go into a, a concert hall or an arena or a pub to watch a band people that i'm going to see in there are going to be kind of like-minded yeah yeah similar yeah. friendly you know uh peers and you know and it's a place where you can just feel like you can escape for a few hours and for something like that to happen um as it did on that night i think is i mean obviously wherever something like that happens it's a tragedy yeah. it's a terrible horrible yeah heartbreaking thing to happen but for it to happen there i don't know it, it, when you're someone who like yourself and obviously i'm a huge music fan as well i think it it hits you very very hard and it you know i, I was at a festival um uh, in wales when i i heard about it and the whole dynamic of the festival for the rest of the weekend just completely changed um yeah so um, yeah, I'm interested. I mean, when you sort of first heard about it, and in the kind of U2 camp, and I know U2 actually got the Eagles of Death Metal guys up on stage with them when they ended up. I think their first kind of public appearance after everything happened was was with U2, yeah. wasn't it? Was that right? Yeah, yeah. So what was the, the as that news kind of began to filter through to you? Um, what were the kind of thoughts and what was the mood like amongst the you guys there around that time? Well, I mean, everybody was just shocked, you know. It was just, it was like, it was, God, we know what, what, what the hell, you know. Um, you know, it's such a, such a shame, you know. I was going to ask you a few things. Best and worst day at work ever. Has there ever been one day where you've thought, my God, get me a job in McDonald's or in an office, get me out of here. And then one day where you just think, 
this is just the best job of all time. Oh, oh no, I, 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 the worst. Um, the worst day was in Nashville when Ozzy didn't turn up at the gig. Right, okay. Um, we were playing, we, we, we were on a, a world tour. Van Halen were opening for us. Got the gig in Nashville. We, we set all the equipment up. Van Halen did the set. Bill turned up. Tony, Geezer, where's Ozzy? Oh, he's, he's still in the hotel. So they go to his room. They walk into his room. It hasn't been touched. The room is completely untouched. Nobody's been in there. And, well, where's Ozzy? There's all like, then suddenly Ozzy's been kidnapped. He's been, he could be, <laughs> he could be dead. I mean, there was, the police were involved. The band cancelled the show. There was a riot in the, the Nashville Auditorium. Oh my God. People started wrecking the place because Sabbath wouldn't, weren't playing after, after Van Halen had been on and done a fantastic set. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we should, once the, and they, they brought in the police and they got rid of the crowds and, um, ah, you know, we swept the stage up. I mean, all our stuff was wrecked and, you know, um, and just like, then we all went back to the hotel and, well, where the bloody hell's Aussie, you know, and there's, they've got like people going around with all the bars looking for him and, and it's about four o'clock in the morning and we were just still sat sat in the lobby just thinking well is this the end of the tour and all this the uh, lift doors to open and Ozzy comes out what time's the gig <laughs> where the bloody hell have you been what had happened was he'd gone to the wrong floor went to this room and the maid was coming out and as he she came up because couldn't open the door as the maid came out he went in went to bed slept in oh my god well just slept through the whole thing <laughs> yeah, unbelievable slept through the whole thing and, and, and because nobody knew, you know, it was just he was in the he was on a different floor in a different room. He he went to that room because and and it just so happened that the maid was coming out of the room and he walked in and closed the door behind him, and nobody went and checked into that room. So it was just a a comedy of errors, you know. And it caused <laughs> so much grief, you know. It's probably one of the famous Aussie things, you know. I mean, I'm. I'm, uh. I'm it's in my book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I love the idea of Ozzy peacefully snoozing in somebody's hotel room as the entire <laughs> entire oh. this venue just gets smashed to pieces. Oh, unbelievable! It was. It was unbelievable. I mean, it was. It was a classic. Um, a greatest. Well, I've got. I've got too many greatest. Greatest ones. I mean, you know. You know, you know, watching watching the wall at Wembley, and you know, I mean, um, mm. Tina Turner. I mean, even 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 the last tour I did with Sabbath, you know, the end yeah. the end concert in Birmingham because I started working back with Sabbath during the last like ten years, mm-hmm. um, just driving one of the production trucks for the beat up. But 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 still, it was great to be back with them. And you know, I mean, I went I went I went I, I just went to um, LA a few weeks ago for the Emmy Award, the Lifetime Achievement Awards, and. That was nice to see the the boys get their lifetime achievement award. Yeah. You know, and I, went, I spent the day with Bill. You know, and we, we were all just talking like as if it was just yesterday. You know, mm. and, and yeah, I keep in touch with with Tony, and you know, I mean, we're all. I mean, I'm nearly seventy. They're in the seventies. You know, mm. so it's it's nice. You know, yeah, of course. What was it like? The atmosphere that that last Black Sabbath gig in Birmingham. Um, it was incredible. It was it was incredible. Yeah, it was at the NEC. Um, but it wasn't actually the last gig because what we did the next day, we went to this studio in um, the middle of the Oxfordshire, and we they, they recorded um, some songs and played played on in the studio. So the last gig, there was no audience there. Obviously, yeah. it, was in a, it was in an old um, farm studio. So that was actually the last gig. <laughs> so you got to see the last, last, oh, yeah, the real yeah, last yeah, gig. Yeah, I've got photographs of it as well. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So I actually saw the last gig. Was it an emotional? I mean, oh, like yeah. someone like Tony or Geezer doesn't strike me as the sort of people that would get that. I mean, I've interviewed um, 
I've interviewed Geezer, I interviewed him a couple of months back about his new band. And yeah. I was sort of saying, yeah, you must miss Sabbath. And he was like, well, I don't know. Really. Did, did, did they get, you know, <laughs> that he's such a, you know, I guess it's that, that kind of dry, brummy kind of yeah. like droll yeah. sense of humour those guys have got. Did it get emotional at all? Did you see quivering lips, maybe like watery eyes at all, glassy eyed? Or were they all just like, all right, see you next month or something for when we catch up? Was it? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was it, it was it it was a bit odd. It was it was a bit odd. Yeah, I mean, it was just like right, they've done the job. I'm going home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they're the the great. Well, I mean, they, 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 one one of the, the camaraderie and um, the laughs. I mean, out of all the bands I've worked for, I've never laughed so much as I did with Sabbath. Well. um Graham, thanks very much for chatting to us. We're going to let you get on. Oh, one last thing I was going to ask you, actually, yeah. which I ask to all kind of backstage people. Have you ever, have you ever yourself looked on that stage, you know, be it Black Sabbath, Tina Turner, Rolling Stones, U2, whoever those huge bands are, looking at that stadium full of people, all the adulation, have you ever thought to yourself, that's what I would rather be doing. That's what I'd like no. to do. You're not a musician <laughs> at all. No, not an no, aspiring no. musician. No, 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 never. The only talent I have was uh, I, I like drawing and I, I like painting. Yeah, and, and I've had I've had a few little exhibitions over the years, and um, I like my photography. Um, I like putting them on a wall and letting people see. I'm not I'm not a person who ever wanted to be on the stage mm. and expose myself. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't a frustrated um, musician. You know, I used to do my job. Set my set the kit up, set the back line up, and that was good enough for me. You know, let them go out there and do it. You know, yeah, we uh, yeah, no, it's um, yeah. Well, that's good. It's good to know that it's yeah. You, know, you speak to some people and they go, oh yeah, <laughs> I started playing bass, and now all I do is hand someone a bass, and oh, if only I could get out on that stage. So it's good that it's good that you've uh, that you've never felt that. That would be a, no, a frustrating no, forty odd years of your life if you did do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I never, I never did that. Um, I mean, that's that's why I think maybe I lasted so long. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, anyway, Graham, uh, it's been really great speaking to you, and um, I'm going to let you plug your book again. How black is our Sabbath? Go on, give it another shout. Yep, yeah, there you go. How black was our Sabbath? And also, the e-book is Black Sabbath: The Thrill of It All, and it's on Amazon, and it's a good read it's a good read certainly is and it's um yeah it's been lovely speaking to you about you know a, a glorious period in music history thanks very much for chatting just graham and yeah, well, we very much appreciate it i hope it's been okay thanks that was graham right as i said you know a little plug for his book one more time how black was our sabbath uh, he co-wrote that with david tangy another one of his um black sabbath crew member friends and um as i as i said you know uh graham is a man who has worked with some of the biggest names in music has seen some of the most iconic and incredible things uh that live music has has ever had to offer and by the sounds of tina turner at madison square garden and you know black sabbath throughout the 70s going through to the you know the rolling stones and u2 in that weird position there in the wall with roger waters amazing amazing stuff um and uh yes yeah, so i hope you enjoyed that it's great chat and i want to say thank you very much to uh, graham for giving up his evening to uh, to talk to me as i slatheringly fanboyed about black sabbath and maybe a little bit too much i do bloody love black sabbath why wouldn't you um anyway thanks very much for listening as i said um going to give you another little social media plug find us on facebook and give us a little thumbs up and a like and you know and uh, find us on twitter as i said at road crew pod that's where you can find us on twitter and maybe you know if there's someone that you would like to hear from in the world of um road crew uh someone who who has a particularly interesting job who you think will have many many fine stories to tell just give us a little shout give us a little tweet give us a little message on facebook and we'll see if we can get hold of them and i'll get them in the studio and see if i can uh get some stories out of them but for now uh thanks very much for listening we'll be back next week with another episode with somebody equally as thrilling as our guests that we have already had on the show and um leave a little review as well on on itunes i would appreciate that but for now uh we will see you later thanks very much for listening cheery bye